Tiflings, good morning. How are you? Welcome to First Contact Radio. Hope you made it through the week safe and sound. Let's start things off with our space weather for today. We've got our solar wind going at 290.7 kilometers per second, so you can see it has slowed down quite a bit from where it was. At the end of last week, it was in the 400s. Our solar flare activity, or our planetary K index, is extremely low. It's down to a 1 which means there isn't a lot of geomagnetic activity taking place and that's reflected in our forecast here M-class flares are down to only about 30 percent chance and then of course there is the geomagnetic storms which are very low at 5 percent as far as near-earth objects we are at uh, the 23rd there's an object coming through pretty small 1.1 kilometer and it's quite a distance away. There's another object um, I saw that they say was just recently discovered that is coming through and is going to pass by on Thanksgiving but it's pretty small indeed and it's going to pass away further than the one 2005 that just passed by. And then on the 25th the moon will pass in front of the sun slightly off center producing a partial solar eclipse visible from Antarctica. Tasmania and parts of South Africa and New Zealand. Maximum coverage occurs around 100 miles off the coast of Antarctica where the sun will appear to be a slender 9% crescent. So a lot of good interesting activity taking place. Alright now first story we're going to do today and through the course of today it's going to be Ron Paul. We're going to do a lot of Ron Paul uh, news today. We're going to start things off. He was on Face the Nation over the course of the weekend. So if you didn't get a chance to see that, th don't worry, you're going to get to see it right now. Here we go. May have been a fringe candidate before, but he has moved into a statistical tie for the lead in Iowa, where the first contest will be held in just a matter of weeks. Is he surprised? Not so much. I think we've been there a long time. I think they've been in denial. <laughs> Nor is he bashful about where he says our economic problem began. The Federal Reserve is immoral, uh, it's unconstitutional, and it's a disaster. As for foreign policy and a strong national defense. I think military spending diminishes our defense. I'd much rather see that money spent at home. He's with us to talk about that and a lot more. Then we'll turn to the deepening Washington gridlock over taxes and the deficit. We'll hear from Pennsylvania's Republican Senator Pat Toomey, a member of the so-called Super Committee that's grappling with that. And we'll bring in West Virginia's Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, who has his own ideas about the mess Congress is in as we explore the broader question. Is all this the reason that Paris Hilton, according to some polls, is now more popular than Congress? This is Face the Nation. CBS News in Washington, Face the Nation with Bob Seifer. And good morning again. We begin this morning with Congressman Ron Paul. The polls, Mr. Paul, suggest that you are now in the thick of it out in Iowa, basically in a statistical tie with uh, Romney, with Kane, and with Mr. Gingrich. So I want to ask you some questions now that you're among the front runners, we need to know more about your positions uh, on the issues. And I want to start with foreign policy, because your statements over the years posted on your website and elsewhere, some of the things you have said in the debates, suggest that you believe that 9-11 happened because of actions that the United States took. Is that correct? Is that correct? Well, I, I think there's an influence, and that's exactly what... Uh, you know, the 9-11 Commission said, that's what the DOD has said, and that's also what the CIA has said, and that's what a lot of researchers have said. And uh, just remember, immediately after 9-11, we removed the base from Saudi Arabia, so there is a connection. That doesn't do the whole full explanation, but our policies definitely had an influence, and you talk to the people who committed it and those individuals who would like to do us harm, uh, they say, yes, uh, we don't like uh, American bombs to be fallen on our country, and we don't like uh, the intervention that we do in their nations. So to deny this, is, I think, is very dangerous. But to well, argue the case 
that they want to do us harm because we're free and prosperous, I think is a very, very dangerous notion because it's not true. Well, I, I would, I would uh, question the import of what some of those commissions found that, that you cited there. But basically what you are saying, uh, Mr. Paul, is that it was America's fault, that 9-11 happened and it was our fault that it happened. No, I, I, think that's, I think that's a, miscon, a misconstruing of what I'm saying because America is you and I. And uh, we didn't cause it. The average American didn't cause it. But if you have a flawed policy, it may influence it. When uh, uh, Ronald Reagan went into Lebanon, he was deeply, he deeply regretted this because he said if he'd have been more neutral, those Marines wouldn't have died in Lebanon because the policy was flawed. The same thing that McNamara said after the Vietnam War. And he wrote in his memoirs, that, you know, if, uh, if he would have changed, if, it, if we don't learn from our policies, it won't be worth anything. So I'm saying policies have an effect, but that's a far cry from blaming America. Well, I mean, in America, you're right, supposed to be able uh, to uh, criticize right, your yeah. own government. You're supposed to be able to criticize your own government without saying you're course, un-American. But what that's you're, what the implication But what, what you are saying, it, it was the government's fault. That, that basically is what you are saying. Let me move on to, from something else. I'm saying the policy ma the policymakers fault. Uh, the policymakers fault. Contributed to it. All right. It's contributed uh, to it. Let contributed me ask you this: Am I correct that your idea of how to discourage Iran from building nuclear weapons is to be nicer to Iran's leaders? Is that correct? Well. I, I, no, I think to be, uh, you know, we have 12,000 diplomats. I'm suggesting that maybe we ought to use some of them. But just think of how we prevented a nuclear war with the Soviets when the Soviet uh, missiles were put in Cuba. We didn't say we're going to attack you. Uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev talked and they made a deal. You take your weapons out of Cuba, we'll take them out of Turkey. That's the kind of talk that I want. I don't. I think the greatest danger now is for us to overreact, and this is what, what I'm fearful of. Iran doesn't have a bomb. There's no proof. And there's no new information regardless of this uh, recent report. And for us to overreact and talk about bombing Iran, that's much more dangerous. We got the, we well, got the Libyans to, to, we got the Libyans to get rid of their nuclear power and their nuclear weapons. And look at what happened to them. I, I, so I, Mr. we got to understand that. May I interrupt just for a second? No one has suggested in the U.S. government that we are going to bomb Iran. What they have said is that we're going to impose very tough sanctions. You are against sanctions on Iran. Is that correct? Yeah, because sanctions are the initial step to war. I was opposed to all the sanctions for 10 years and the bombing that uh, was occurring with Iraq because I said it would lead to war. Uh, but if you say nobody's suggesting it, why don't you listen to the debates? I mean, uh, listen Mr. to some of Mr. the other Paul, candidates. May I correct you? I am listening to the debates. I know there have been some candidates who've talked about that, including Mr. Romney. The United States right. government has not said we're going to bomb Iran. I mean, that, that's just a No, bad. obviously they haven't said. Obviously they haven't said that. But the implication is, is nothing is off the table. You've heard those statements. Well, yes. All right. Let's move on then. Do you think there is any place in the world where United States forces should be stationed? You've talked about bringing them home from Afghanistan, from uh, from Iraq. Uh, is there any place where you think uh, it helps us to have U.S. forces stationed? No, other than the fact that I think a submarine is a very worthwhile weapon, and I believe we can defend ourselves with submarines and all our troops back at home. Uh, this whole idea that we have to be in 130 country and 900 bases, now they've just invented a weapon that can hit any spot in the world in one hour. So you I mean, would... What's this idea? This is old. This is old-fashioned idea that you have to keep troops on 900 bases around the world. Makes no sense at all. Besides, so, we're bankrupt. We can't afford it anymore. So longer. you would, you would, uh, if you were president, you'd bring home the troops from Japan. You'd bring home the troops from South Korea. You would. Okay. Absolutely, and the people are with, the people are with me on that because we can't afford it. it. Would save us a lot of money. All those troops would spend their money here at home, and besides, those troops overseas aggravate our enemies, motivate our enemies. I think it's a danger to our national defense, and we can save a lot of money cutting out the <clears throat> military expenditures that contribute nothing to our defense. All right, let me ask you about some domestic things. Your plan to get the country back uh, on a firm financial footing is to close, including, among other things, the Department of Education, the Department of Energy, Commerce, Interior, Housing, and Urban Development. You would cut back the federal workforce by 10 percent. You've also suggested we should uh, close FEMA, which is the Emergency uh, Management uh, Agency. I, right. I have to ask you this. What 
do you do about all the things that those agencies control, run, supervise? For example, what, what happens to the national parks if you close the Department of the Interior? Do we just let them go by the by or what? No, no, no way. And, and the program deals with this. There's transition funds, but we would like to see a lot of land sold off, but we're not going to just ignore the parks. Uh, no, not, not at all. I mean, uh, the, the money isn't there. These are departments that are doing too much. The American people are sick and tired of our educational system. Just think of how we've been involved and give out loans and we educate students. The price of the, the cost of education goes up. They graduate, they don't have jobs, and they have a trillion dollars worth of debt. We have to question that. This country's in bankruptcy. We have All to right. deal with it. We can't, we can't remain in denial. And that is my argument, and believe me, this is why I'm getting a good reception on the campaign trail. All right. Well, uh, we want to thank you for coming on this morning and for answering the questions. Ron Paul, thank you. All right. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to address some of those issues a little bit more. We're going to, with some more uh, news and information for Ron Paul. But before we get to that, other news is at hand. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, and here we go. Thank you very much, Dirk, for that intro. All right, we have four news stories again today, four UFO stories. The first one comes to us from latest-ufosightings.net. This is a UFOs flying over Bronx. Flying over the Bronx. All right. First thing we have here says these unknown lights were recorded in Bronx, the northmost of the first five boroughs of New York City recorded on doesn't say the date. This was just the other day, though, over the course of the weekend. And the, I believe it was the 18th. So let's check this out. What you're going to see here, you got the, uh, right in the middle of the screen is where you're going to see. There you go. You can see two of them up there right now. There's a third one that's going to join in. You see them in a the distance doing their blinking. And then we're going to zip ahead here, a little bit closer view. All right, a little bit better view. You can see there's actually three of them here in a triangular formation, blinking in and out for some reason. And so you can definitely make out the rectangular or triangular formation right there. You see right in the middle of the screen there. One, two, three. All right, this took place in over Bronx just this last couple days. Now, our next story comes to us from Peru. This is ufoblogger.com. A uh, giant-headed alien mummy found in Peru. Goes on to say, Earlier this year we reported star child skull shocking DNA results show the skull is alien. Now in another separate development, a mummified elongated skull in Peru could finally prove the existence of aliens. The strangely shaped head almost as big as 20 inches, has baffled anthropologists. It was one of two sets found, it, w it was one of, excuse me, it's one of two sets of remains found in the city of Andula Halilias in the southern province of Quimpicanichi. The skeleton sets were discovered by Renato da Vila Requilme, who works for the Privado Rito Sanitos Museum in Cusco in southern, southeastern Peru. He said that the eye captivities, cap, cavities are much larger than normally seen in humans, which you can see right here. And it goes down here. There is a soft spot in the skull carved in an, called an open fontel, which is characteristic of children in their first year of life. Yet the skull has two large molars only found in much large older humans. All right, very interesting there, and you continue on. David Riquelme said three anthropologists from Spain and Russia arrived at the museum last week to investigate the findings. He agreed it was not human being and would conduct further studies. He added, although the assessment was superficial, it is obvious that the features do not correspond to any ethnic group in the world. The remains of an eyeball in the right socket will 
help determine its genetic DNA and clearly up the controversy if the human or not. The second mummy is incomplete and it's only 30 centimeters or 12 inches. All right. So very interested indeed. The story is up on our page. First Contact Radio, right-hand side, UFO News. All right. Now we have uh, six UFOs tape, videotaped near helicopter over the UK. Now, this one is very faint. I fast-forwarded it a bit so you could see it. You're going to see the helicopter here, and you're going to see just these faint areas. They mark them out here for you to see. All right. Now, they're all around the helicopter, and when they really slow it down, there you go. You can see a little bit better view of it right there. There's a couple of them coming in. They hide behind the clouds here, and they are all around where the helicopter is. It says, according to eyewitness testimony, I had shot video of emergency helicopter on November 5th. When I viewed, I noticed a few word, weird things. I first only noticed the four slower moving things, and after zooming in the footage, I found the faster ones. So, there you go. Check this out. It's at our page, firstcontactradio.com, right-hand side. Now, We'll come back to that one. Here is uh, from China, ufoblogger.com. says, a mysterious structure is found in the middle of the Gobi Desert. Yesterday, we received email along with images and coordinates. In one picture, there seems to be wide line draw lines drawn with some white material, or maybe the dust we have been dug up by machinery. It is located in Dunghong, Jinquan, Gansu, north of the Shulu River, which crosses Tibetan Plateau in the west into, into the Kumtang Desert. It covers an area approximately one mile by more than 3,000 feet. The tracks are perfectly executed. They seem to be designed to be seen from orbit. Perhaps it's some kind of targeting or calibrating grid for Chinese spy satellites. Maybe it's a QR code for aliens. Nobody knows. And as you can see, it's quite interesting. This is what is seen up above. It's another similar pattern located 20 miles west of the first pattern. And then, of course, we hear here's another weird one. This looks like an airport structure. We've seen these above Area 51. It says here's another weird airport structure, except it's bright cyan. Seems full of water or made of weird material. And look at another airport structure next to it, perhaps a decoy. Okay, and a few other coordinates for you to check out. Here's one that's a roundish one, and then they make some relationship to this disc here that was in the fields. Is this set up in that manner? All right, lots of good information for you to check out right there, so please do. And the last story here comes to us from UFO Digest. Says, this is submitted by Dirk Vanderplog. We are pleased to inform you about an important book entitled Herculibus, or Red Planet, a work that deals with some highly important current issues from the controversial nuclear tests in the oceans and the dreadful future consequences to the much-discussed question of existence of conscious beings in other planets of the universe. With enlightening language, this book informs us about the existence of a heavenly body six times bigger than Jupiter approaching our planet Earth. We are told not only about the consequence of this approach, but also about the true origin of climate change and the great geological activity that is taking place deep down on the bottom of the sea. Based on a direct conscious experience, the author, V.M. Rabulu, teaches us in his book the system to eliminate our psychological defects and the techniques for astral projection as the only formulas to face the forthcoming times. Herbuculus or Red Planet is a result of the author's research in super superior dimensions of nature and therefore is a book written with consciousness. Anyone can experience themselves. The statements in this work are progressively fulfilled over time. Due to the immense importance of this universal message, the Alcyon Association is sending from Spain free copies of the book to any interested persons. And you can just go here and you can order your from Herbuculus, H-E-R-C-O-L, 
www.bus.tv. Now I went ahead and I did order one of these books. And you can see you got here's Planet Earth right here. And uh, over here. And then up here you've got the red planet. It's coming down. It's going to hit the Earth. And if it hits, you could see there's not really, um, well, it's much bigger than the Earth. Interesting book, interesting read. Talks about, um, as I said, things we can do and astral projection, learning to go out of the body, learning to deal with some of your psychological issues before all of this happens will be important to the transition phase that takes place. So, again, another planet out there that is supposedly coming at us. Another bit of doom. Will it happen? Well, I guess time will tell. I guess time will tell, but we've been here for a long while, and there's been a lot of big rocks out there heading our way. And though there was a lot of people that thought there was going to be something that was going to hit not too, you know, in the last couple months, nothing happened. So sometimes there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of worry, and then nothing goes on. All right, I'm going to jump away for a moment. I'll be back. Enjoy the song. It's called Wake Up. What if our government was responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation? Would you really want to know? These are big questions, but these questions deserve answers. It's time to demand the truth. on your seatbelt and prepare for takeoff. You're about to go on a journey. It's First Contact Radio with Joshua Poet. Strap All right, Dirk, thank you very much. All right, we're back. So continuing on with the news for today, we're going to start off here with the nationalpatriot.com. Goes on to say here that the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled on Obama's eligibility. According to the United States Supreme Court, Obama is ineligible to be the president 
That's right, you read that correctly. The United States Supreme Court has ruled that Obama is ineligible to serve as president. It's not that you haven't been paying attention lately, and yes, you can be excused for missing the ruling as it came down, not in the last few days, but back in 1875. This is the argument currently being made by Liberty Legal Foundation. The Liberty Legal Foundation has filed not one, but two lawsuits. in Arizona and another in Tennessee, neither of which have one single thing to do with Obama's birth certificate or challenging whether or not Obama was born in the United States. There's no need for either in regard to these lawsuits. At the core of the action is a simple request that federal courts uphold Supreme Court ruling. Both lawsuits and the Liberty Legal Foundation promises there will be more would render it impossible for the Democratic National Committee to place Obama's name on the 2012 ballot. Here's the crux of it. Back in 1875, the United States Supreme Court in Minor v. Hamperset ruled that natural-born citizen was defined as children born of two U.S. citizens, regardless of the location of the birth. It was found the Constitution does not, in words, say who shall be natural-born citizens. Resort must be made had elsewhere to ascertain that. At common law, with the nomenclature which the framers of the Constitution were familiar, it was never doubted that all children born in a country of parents who were its citizens became themselves upon birth citizens also. Obama's problem by his own admission and records of the State Department is this. Obama's father was not a U.S. citizen. Therefore, via Minor v. Happerset and the United States Supreme Court in 1875, Obama is ineligible because since his father was not a U.S. citizen, he is not a natural-born citizen. For a person to run as his or her part party's nominee for president, the party must issue certification that the person named is eligible under the United States Constitution to become president. Because the Constitution does not specify the definition of natural-born citizen, it was left to the United States Supreme Court, which in 1875 defined it as a person born in a country of parents who were its citizens, and Obama's father was not a U.S. citizen. Bring this up to your liberal friends, and they will laugh at you and call you a right-wing nutjob for saying Obama is ineligible, but the quick and the accurate response is clear. You are not saying this, and neither is the Liberty Legal Foundation. Obama is ineligible, so saith the United States Supreme Court, and if they are to attempt to label the United States Supreme Court of 1875 as right-wing nut jobs, so be it, and good luck with that. Uh, you can see it goes on to explain more of the article, more of the actual ruling, and then of course there is the liar in the office. Liar in the office. All right. Now, speaking of Obama, here is, it says, New Obama law warned will jail 500,000 Americans. That's half a million. Foreign Ministry reports circulating the Kremlin today are warning that an already explosive situation in the United States is about to get a whole lot worse as a new law put forth by President Obama is said capable of seeing up to 500,000 Americans jailed for the crime of opposing their government sparking the concern of Russian diplomats over the growing totalitarian bent of the Obama government is the planned reintroduction of what these reports call one of the most draconian laws ever introduced in a free society that is titled the Violent Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Prevention Act. First introduced in Congress in 2007 by Democratic Representative Jane Harman, this new law passed the U.S. House of Representatives by a secretive voice vote it failed to pass the U.S. Senate, after which it was believed dead until this past week, when it was embraced by Obama, who became the first American president to name his own citizens as a threat to national security. Well, as an American, I think we should label Obama a threat to our national security. You know, he's got these stupid laws and things that he wants to abide by. This man has been a threat to our security since the moment he took office. This is like a time when we have no president leading us, no leader. No wonder the United States has such problems. you got a wimpy guy like that in the office, and then you've got an overbearing wife that is telling him what to do, and she's surprised that she got booed when she was at the NASCAR races this last weekend. 
We've got the wrong people in the White House, my friends. I hope by now you understand that. But what they want to do is they want to get everybody to be quiet. Don't talk up about them. Don't say anything bad about them doing nothing. They're doing nothing. They're doing nothing at all, and they don't deserve to be in office, either one of them. Because at this point in time, she's just as much in office as he is, because he really is not much of a, well, stand-up kind of guy. So, you know, he's being told what to do by somebody who has a little bit more cojones than he does. Now, here's a story. It's a college story. UC Davis Faculty Association calls for Chancellor's resignation after egregious police brutality. I don't know if you happen to see this. It was really insane. All of these students here said yesterday was an absolutely appalling display of police brutality against University of California Davis students who were peacefully protesting. Students were being attacked by police with pepper spray as they sat passably without fighting back at the slightest. The show of force was truly disgusting and thankfully the video of the assault has spread across the internet like wildfire. In reaction to the incident, faculty members that are part of UC Davis Faculty Association have called for the resignation of UC Davis Chancellor Linda B. Kachi. The call includes demand for a policy change that will end police forcibly removing nonviolent students, faculty, staff, and community protesters. They aptly point out the University of California should be taking a leadership role in encouraging the exercise of free speech, not in suppressing it. Quite unfortunately, they have indeed been playing a large role in suppressing free speech, not only at UC Davis, but also at UC Berkeley, where police utilize brutal tactics as well against both students and faculty. They point out that by authorizing police action, she was essentially authorizing the use of excessive force against wholly nonviolent student protesters. They called Kachi's move a gross failure of leadership, and indeed this is the case, and I fully support the push for res her resignation. More to this article, you can actually see what went on here. Here, we can just look at a little bit right here. You can see, here you've got the students all locked together, ducked down, and then you've got the corrupt police officers. Look at them here, the corrupt police officers with their big cans of spray. They're wearing their body armor because, you know, these students that are sitting on the ground with their arms locked pose a threat. And therefore, it's necessary that these big, strong men have to have body armor and then spray them with pepper spray. Because that's what cowards do. All of these men here in these uniforms, those are cowards. You want to know what a coward looks like? You're looking at them right there. Cowards. That's all that they are cowards because they're they're brutalizing young kids who are sitting there peacefully don't worry the police in this country are going to find themselves on the short end of the stick because they're going to get screwed just like everybody else and they're going to be even in a worse spot because the ones who are going to really stick it to them good are the ones who right now that they are protecting and then when the ones that are protecting turn their back on them the police are really going to be in a jam because what are they going to do? They're going to go and want to be now supportive of the people they were just beating on? Well, I think people are going to have something to say about that and it's not going to be very, uh, well, it's not going to be open arms, come on in, be part of the gang because they're already part of a gang. They're a gang that beats on people and that's not right. Now, we've heard a lot of stories about the Federal Reserve. Ron Paul's been talking about it a good deal. Here is a story. It's up at intelhub.com. It's an actual Federal Reserve employee saying that the Federal Reserve is a privately owned organization. It said recently Humboldt State University was visited by David Lang and Elena Takatmanova from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco where they presented some information about the Federal Reserve System. I, along with the department, took video of the event. While I was unable to take footage of the entire event, I was able to get David Lang's presentation as well as a short, short portion of the question and answer period. There were also presentations from students from an economics class. Each group had to play the role of private central banking head for each of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. They had to make policy suggestions for the Federal Reserve Banking System going forward. 
And during the course of this, one of the students did ask if the Federal Reserve was private, and of course, it was confirmed, yes, that it was. So go check out this link. You'll be able to see the whole thing. And this was uh, to the Inhale Hub. It's written by David Hain, H-A-Y-N-I-E. All right, moving right along. An, in, an article at InfoWars about the Super Committee. It says Super Committee was a super joke. This comes to us from the economic colla collapse. Does anyone need any additional evidence that our political system is completely broken? The bipartisan Congressional Super C Committee that was given two months to come up with at least $1.2 trillion in deficit cuts over the next decade has failed to reach an agreement. It's an epic failure and a national embarrassment. The truth is that they never even came close to an agreement. In fact, as you will read below, the two sides on the panel have even barely talked to each other. At the end, the su Super Committee was a super joke. Meanwhile, the U.S. national debt has passed a $15 trillion mark, and we are facing trillion-dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. We are heading directly for a national financial disaster, and our leaders seem powerless to do anything about it. Well, that's because our leaders have no power. Our leaders are corrupt, and our leaders are unable to really solve any problems because the leaders... Well, they're not leaders. That's the first problem. When you have a country that is led by a non-leader, Obama, then that's just the problem you're going to have. You need to have a leader. We don't have a leader. We have a joker in the office who has fooled the people. And as long as you keep listening to them out here, folks, as long as you keep buying into the lies, the lies are going to continue to happen. You know, I don't know what it's going to take for people really to pay attention and really open their eyes. But something drastic is going to happen. And people are going to be displeased with the results, especially when they find out that it's because they did nothing. Okay, this isn't the day and age where you can just write to your congressman and expect something's going to happen. You need to be a little bit more out there. You need to go out and stand at these protests. You need to actually go to meetings and, you know, raise your hand and, and voice your concerns at other events. You can't just sit home and do nothing. Got to be a little bit more proactive. Join with other people. Join groups. Join committees. Make phone calls. Start a radio show. Do something. Don't just sit home on your butt doing nothing and then wonder later when things get bad why it got that way. Remember... Bad things happen when good people say and do nothing. And this world is filled with a lot of good people. So don't be one of those that says and does nothing. Now here's a story. This is, uh, says a fifth grader, was a fifth grader kicked out of his elementary school for saying a local newscaster resembles Barack Obama. The guy dressed in the suit and the tie, smiling and shaking a bevy of hands, caught Grayson Thomas's eye. Grayson wasn't alone. Teachers and other students at Stevenson's Ranch Elementary School couldn't take their eyes off the lunchtime visitor either. Grace and a fifth grader at the campus near Santa Clarita, California, noticed the gentleman's outward characteristics. Tall and lean, good-looking, charismatic, charming, energetic. Then he made one fatal, fatal error. Grace in 11 pulled a little made-you-look joke on a schoolmate seated next to him saying something along the lines of, Obama's visiting our school today referring to the magnetic figure holding court nearby. It wasn't Obama, of course, but from Grayson's point of view, Chris Shobley, morning co-anchor on KTLA 5 TV news program in Los Angeles, did possess a demeanor and continence similar to the president's. According to Grayson's dad, Darren Thomas, who provided the previous details, what happened next was crazy. Word of his son, Obama... Shobley comparison spread to Shobley's daughter, Shelby, who was sharing lunch with her newsman's father, and Shelby was uncomfortable with Grayson's statement saying it felt racist. Then a teacher was summoned and the principal, Candace Fleece, then the New Hall School District Superintendent, Mark w Winger, and that very afternoon, November 4th, Grayson was kicked out of Stevenson Ranch for good, his father says, for implying that all black men look alike. Well, folks, that is absolutely ridiculous. You just need to get over it. You need to get over this racial issue. Guess what? People look alike. Black people, white people, 
red people, yellow people, they look alike. Also, they also look like other people from other races. It's just part of how it works. People behave the same. Sometimes people say the same things. Sometimes people act the same way. That's just how it is. Now, whoever's talking about racism, they're the ones who have the problem. In this case, the little girl has been so badly misinformed that that was her response to go and say this was a racist statement. It's unfortunate that the little girl has that in her mind because that came to her from somebody, her parents, her teachers, somebody misinformed her. The issue of racism needs to stop. I don't know what needs to happen for it to stop, but what are you going to do when you have other races of beings coming down to this planet that aren't black or white or red or yellow? What are you going to do if you see somebody that's green or perhaps blue or purple or gray? How are you going to deal with that if you can't even deal with the, the issue of skin color right now? It's a big issue, this racism. It's a really stupid issue, if you ask me, that people in this day and age are still dealing with it. I know a lot of people wanted to believe that when Obama got in office, all of that would change, that people would look at the racial issue as one have been solved. But unfortunately, that didn't happen because, it, first of all, Obama is not a leader who didn't come in to address this issue. And second, the issue goes much deeper than the president. It goes to the people that are living upon this planet. You need to stop listening to the news because they are pointing out issues of racism that don't need to be there. You not need to stop listening to people that are corrupt and are lying to you. You have to let the whole racial issue drop aside and not be caught up in the co color of a person's skin. And because somebody points out that somebody looks like somebody else doesn't mean they're being racist. It just means that they're being observant. Remember Sesame Street? It plays to little kids all the time. One of these things is not like the other. Well, kids are taught to look at things and see when things are similar. That's all. That's all. It's ridiculous that this kid was kicked out of school for recognizing that. And it's even more ridiculous that he's been labeled as being racist because of that. That's not right. Someone needs to fix this. For the adults and the parents that let this happen, shame on you. That's completely wrong. The racist isn't the kid. The racist is you. The one who took the kid out of school, you're the racist. You need to come correct and fix your problem. It's not the kid. It's not the little kid who's saying it. It's the older kids and the older ones who are influencing that. Fix that problem. Things will become better. Now, very last but not least for today before we get into our meditation is I'm going to play a big chunk of this next report. This was uh, highlights from the Thanksgiving Family Forum, and this is just about Ron Paul. So let's listen to what was said here. Dr. Paul, I'd like to begin with you. Every debate begins with a specific policy question, but this is a little different. Someone on this stage hopes to be able to take the oath of office 14 months from now, and at the end of that oath are the words, so help me God. When you hear those four words, if you have the opportunity and the privilege to say them, what will come to mind? Well, I think they're very important. Uh, we take, a, those of us who have been in Congress and served in government, we take an oath frequently. We take an oath to uphold the Constitution, and that's what we do when we take an oath uh, when we're sworn in as president. We emphasize this. But I think what that does, it emphasizes it even more so because of the significance and the importance. And it reiterates the fact that we swear to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law. And to, this, uh, to me, this would mean that you're not only saying this you know, in front of a small number of people, not only in front of the nation, but before our God, which means the significance is that much greater. So those of us who have done this before, and I've taken my oath rather seriously, very seriously, and believe that I've done a very good job in upholding the Constitution, and even when sometimes it's difficult, and this to me would send the signal that by saying, so help me God, I really will obey the Constitution and that pledge. 
I think the uh, issue is obviously very important, and we can charge one side or the other of, of influencing our culture too much. But the goal of government isn't to mold society and mold people. The, the role of government is to preserve liberty so we as individuals assume the responsibility and our families assume the responsibility. Our, our values should come from our family and from our church. But once, once we say, well, the liberals are doing this because they want this economic interference and we're going to have perfect balance and fairness, they overdo it. But you can do it on both sides. You can say, well, we're going to make people better by having more laws. I think culture is very important. Culture has a reflection on the law, and I think that is very good. But the law can't reflect the morality of the people. If you do that, you have embarked on something where you sacrifice liberty. Once you turn this over to government, when government assumes this role, it can only do that at the sacrifice of liberty. So our goal ought to be to preserve liberty so that we have our religious values and we make our own decisions. If we can make our self-determination for our hereafter and our spiritual life, certainly on our own personal habits and our economic habits and how we spend our money, certainly we should assume that the people can do this. The guidance should come from individuals, from our family, and from our church. You know, I think it's, it's wrong to assume that if you legalize liberty and freedom, that because somebody might do something wrong, you don't want to legalize it. Liberty doesn't mean libertine. It means you have choices, but you suffer the consequences. It does not mean endorsement. When you legalize freedom of choice, think about it in a religious sense. We legalize, and we do a pretty good job in this country on the First Amendment. We legalize our freedom of choice in our religious value. But in this country, you're even allowed to be an atheist. But if you say, well, there's the danger of being atheist, so we can't legalize freedom of choice in religion, or we can't legalize freedom. Maybe somebody will want too many homeschoolers. So no, you want to legalize liberty. You don't want to designate what your beliefs are going to be because somebody might abuse it and they have to assume the responsibility for making the mistakes but because somebody might make a bad choice you don't say give up on liberty this is what the liberals do when they come to economics somebody might not make a good choice they might not take care of themselves and they might not save for them for their retirement so therefore we have to be the protector we have to protect the people from themselves so i think overall the defense of liberty is really what we need in this country because we're losing it unfortunately what is your world view and speak of it in terms of freedom responsibility and morality I, I talk about it a whole lot because I talk about freedom a lot and I talk about responsibility and I tell young people and I talk to a lot of young people that if we can get a free society today and get you out into a position where you don't have to endorse government medicine and government <coughs> education and you can opt out of social security, I says one thing is if you get your freedom, you have to accept the responsibility. You can't, if you fail in taking care of yourself, and if you want your freedom to do that and you don't do well, you don't have a right to go to your neighbor directly and you don't have a right to do, go to your government and say, go to my neighbor and take care of me because I didn't meet up with my responsibilities. They have to face the consequences. No, no the, def the states definitely have a right to be wrong and the states are supposed to correct it. But there are limits and that's why we have a constitution. But the Constitution doesn't give license to the federal government. I mean, the federal government has taken license, and they're too much involved. But the Constitution is a restriction on the federal government. It's not a restriction on the states, and it's not a restriction on personal liberties. So therefore, what we must do is obey the law. Slavery and civil liberties, uh, I mean, there's quite a few things, but not most things, most things were left to the states. Monetary issue was left to the federal government. Defense was left to the federal government. But most like education, why in the world have we ever drifted to the point where we allow this casualness to ignore the Constitution and say it's a federal function? We don't need the Department of Education. We need those things taken care of up at the state level. Governor, is there a third area you want to cut? <laughs> <laughs> On 
that, I have supported the amendment that defines life at conception, I think as important, but I don't endorse the idea that the enforcement should come from the federal government. We don't need another police force in Washington. We already have 100,000 bureaucrats running around with guns, so we don't need more enforcement. All acts of violence under our Constitution, like murder and uh, injury and robbery, uh, that's not a federal offense, it's a state offense, and laws do vary, so I would not want to repeal that provision. It was meant that it would be handled at, at the states. And we have to remember, when we tend to nationalize things, we expose ourselves to great danger, because when they make a mistake, it's national. This is the reason that we had Roe versus Wade. They should have never heard that case. They nationalized it, so I'm very cautious about uh, nationalizing uh, nationalizing these laws. So it would be much better to uh, state when life begins, make the law enforcement at the, at the state level, which has been uh, traditional. But uh, it, it should not be that we uh, enforce this law at the national level, but there's no reason why we can't define when life begins. But, but if they nationalize the problem, why is it wrong to nationalize the solution? Well, what you, and, and I would be glad to do that. And the solution, I could have, it would have been solved 10 years ago because I've been pushing a law that could have been passed by majority vote when we had the House and the Senate and the presidency. If we would have been determined, we could have repealed Roe versus Wade by passing the law of the, called the We the People Act. It removes the jurisdictions from the federal court. So you remove this jurisdiction, which is a constitutional authority that could have been done 10 years ago. We could have continued to work on the amendment. We could have continued to change the courts. But if we would have passed that by majority vote, we would have saved millions of lives. And we have not had the support from the right to life community to at least do that. And I do not understand why that is the case, because we would have accomplished that in short period of time, we would have not distracted from the national solution of amending the Constitution and changing our Supreme Court. I was born and raised in uh, Pennsylvania in a family of five boys uh, during the Depression, so I remember the tail end of the Depression and World War II, and they weren't uh, such a great economic times. But our family was uh, oriented around the church. It was oriented around our family life, a lot of hard work and a work ethic, and uh, the work ethic taught us all at a very young age that you worked and you were rewarded for this. But um, the important things in the church life uh, for me came as a Lutheran uh, making a decision to go through catechism, which is a, somewhat different than others. So that catechism and, 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 going, join, and making the decision to join the church as well as being exposed to a couple of crusades by Billy Grahams was, was the time when I made my commitment to Christ, and it was a very important period in my life. But you said uh, we exempt, you know, our wives and our children because they are so important, and they are at the top of our list. But there was, there was something that was uh, given to me in many ways, in many ways I earned because of something I wanted to do, and that was going through medical school. And finally getting through the military and all my training, but going into medical practice was really astounding because to me it was um, the assumption that people will come to me in trust and, and that I took very, very seriously. And although I didn't have a personal experience like Herman had from medical illness, I got to share those experiences and I'm sure your doctors were uh, very important. So I got to share that with new life coming into the world. There's nothing more marvelous in medicine than sharing new life and having delivered thousands of babies. And this is a very joyous uh, 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 profession. But then there was something else that happened that I feel very blessed with because I had an inquisitive mind and I wanted to know how, well, how the world worked and how the economy worked and why we had recessions and depressions. So I was fascinated not with fishing and hunting, uh, I got fascinated with reading economics, <laughs> and, and then, then I thought speaking out would be a lot of fun, uh, but it, it led to a little bit of involvement in a political life. I feel very lucky that I am blessed that I've been able to practice medicine, have my family, and also participate in public life, and I'm very thankful. I just am curious. Are you prouder that you are a duly elected member of Congress, or are you prouder of your medical profession? Oh, 
the medical profession by far, you know. <laughs> you know, public doctors are still rated a lot higher in the poll than the politicians. <laughs> I think my, uh, my most difficult uh, issue to deal with is I'm my worst, I'm, I'm my own worst critic, you know, and I have to put up my imperfections. I don't know whether it works with anybody else, but I can't stand watching myself on TV because <laughs> all I see are my imperfections. And that is what I strive for, is to try to learn and try to improve my delivery and try to deliver a message which I think is honest and true. And I think I come up short because I think I always uh, can do better. But to find one incident where I, I think I really goofed it or I had to suffer through it, it's, it's almost arrogant to think that I can't find any one thing. If I'd have only done this, things would have been much better off. So I have been so pleased you know, to be able to uh, participate in the great debates of our country and to be uh, able to practice uh, medicine. And uh, I, I think that... Uh, my, great, my greatest thing, uh, you know, in, in family, I mean, I had, had a great family. I've been married 54 years, had five kids, 18 grandchildren, five great ch grandchildren. So, no, so, no so everything is wonderful. So no, no failures. So, <laughs> but the, the biggest struggle I had, it seems so, so incidental, and I don't know whether anybody ever goes through it, but it's something in a teenage year, teenage years are important psychologically, but compared to what I've received and how, what I've been able to do and enjoy, it seems so incidental. And that was a, a physical problem because I, I probably had uh, set for a pretty darn good career in athletics, particularly in track and maybe in football and maybe even baseball. But I had some severe injuries and I really never recovered from them to get to my top speed again. And that was a problem for me. And a teenager, I think maybe we can understand it as a teenager, but you know, now that I look back, why was it such a big deal for me? But it was a big deal for me, but I think I overcame it. <laughs> My first question is for Dr. Paul. We've heard from others of their support of a federal marriage amendment. Would you support a, a, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution defining marriage as the union of one man and one woman? No, I, I have taken a position that I would not support. I, I, I support DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, but uh, I would prefer under our system of laws that uh, all of these problems be taken care of in a constitutional manner, which I would uh, defer to, to the states. But actually, I would go even a little bit further. Me personally, my personal beliefs, although it's not likely to be achieved in my lifetime, is traditionally throughout our, our Christian, uh, Judeo Christian history, it was usually dealt with by the church. And I think the reason we fight and fume over this is because there's, we have too much government everywhere. So I would say that the church should make this decision. That's the most important place to determine, de determine uh, marriage. When you think about in the Old Testament, when uh, the, the God that led the people out of Egypt, uh, uh, was not a king. They didn't have a king. And then when they got to the Holy Land, uh, they, uh, they had judges. They didn't have kings dictating and ruling. But the family dealt with this, and the family dealt with marriages. But they had a judge to determine this. Matter of fact, when the people came to Samuel and said, look, we need more rules and more laws. We want more government to tell us what to do, and, and we, we need more, more of this. Samuel was old and ready to retire, and he says, no, that's a bad mistake. You don't need more rules and more government. You, do, you don't need this. The government will overreact. And today, I think this is what has happened to us. We have deferred to, to, to the federal government. We have way too much government. We should go in the other directions. Before you know it, the next step, what if the next step is, wouldn't it be wonderful if the United Nations defined marriage? I don't want to go up that way. I want to go back down all the way to the family and the church. Believe me, it would be a happier and more peaceful world if we went in that direction rather than asking the government and asking the king to solve all these problems. We need the family to deal with it, and we can take our message and learn something from the Old Testament, how there was such a strong emphasis on the patriarchal society and, and the disputes settled by judges rather than looking for big government. Our final question. 
Every one of the six of you have talked about the importance of preserving life. Nothing takes life more than the declaration of war. I would like to hear from you because nothing frightens a mother more than watching her son or daughter go off. Their pride in their country, but their fear for their child. What is, can you define the moral justification for war? You can use Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria. What is the moral justification? Representative Paul. You know, the, um, the early church struggled with this. I mean, Christ came, Christ taught about peace, and uh, Christ was to be the Prince of Peace, uh, and uh, we were to defend that. But early on, the church struggled with this, and uh, St. Augustine came up with the uh, principles of the just war. I believe in them. I think we should follow those from a religious viewpoint, but we have a constitution that is very clear to guide us to try to prevent these wars. And that is that you don't go to war without a declaration. The wars that we have fought since World War II are all illegal, unconstitutional, immoral, and all were unwinnable, and it was tragic. It was tragic because we did it by failing the rule of law, and the tragedy now of these wars of the past 10 years. 10 years and we have been so complacent, it added $4 trillion to our national debt, uh, 8,500 Americans have been killed in these wars. 44,000 have come home wounded and crippled. Hundreds of thousands are looking for help. And we want to blind ourselves to this. And it isn't in our national defense. It is mischief. It's getting involved where we don't need to be involved. I think it is, a, it, it is an utter tragedy of what's happening. If you want to talk about a family life, there has to be somebody in this audience that has been the bearer of bad news, either a loved one lost or a loved one crippled. And it's on and on. I had one soldier come to me the other day, and he was, he was so against the wars. He spent three or four tours over there. And he says, I lost so many buddies, and I don't know why we were there, and there's no signs of progress over there. But he says, now I'm losing my buddies to suicide. The wars destroy the family, undermine the family, as does economic climate. The bad economics and war is two most destructive things to the family, and we ought to concentrate on that, and we can't concentrate on the economics unless you look at the business cycle, why we have inflation, busts, and booms. Otherwise, we will continue on a downhill path. All right, very good. So... You know, people say that Ron Paul doesn't have a good foreign policy. His foreign policy is one of peace. Bring the troops home. Stop fighting the wars. That seems to be a pretty good foreign policy, don't you think? Stop fighting. All right. Last thing we're going to do here is our meditation for today. So go ahead and close your eyes. Relax. All right, I'd like you to imagine that you are walking down a path. You're walking down a path on a bright, sunny day. It's the beginning of a new cycle, beginning, beginning of a new week. An opportunity to go out, spread your words of wisdom into the world to share love with the world. So as you go out about your journey, think about all of the other people on the path of life other than you. There are many of them walking along, moving along. And you realize that everybody walking along the path has similar concerns, has similar values, has similar ideas. And with all of this, we find that the similarities, they help us to understand more of each other by understanding more of ourselves. There's a phrase 
in the Mayan culture, in Lakesh, means I am another yourself. That when we look at each another, we realize that they are another us looking back at us with the opportunity for us to learn about who we are by understanding who they are and then the reality that we are all one and the same so as you walk down the path understanding the similarities let's just imagine that we're sending love and light out into the world to shine a light upon these similarities and a love to nurture the similarities. For as we realize we are all connected, that we are all part of the same oneness of the great creator, lives moves along in a much smoother pattern because we find ourselves working together more effective and more efficiently. So let's just imagine love going all around the planet can see it as green colored light send the love down into the earth notice the earth smile back send it up into the cosmos and know this planets and the stars and the star nations smiling back down upon the planet and just let the love sit in your heart and notice your heart smile at you And just thinking a good thought for everybody in the world, let's bring our energy and attention back to the present moment on the count of three. Three, coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two, coming back to the present moment filled with faith. And one, coming back to the present moment happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. And there it is. That's the show. That's our prayer. That's our meditation. It's been a pleasure as always. You can go back and review the news and information for today at firstcontactradio.com, right-hand side of the page. you got the UFO news. you got the daily news, everything we've talked about. Till tomorrow, be safe. Have a good day. I'll talk to you soon. Peace. I'm out of here.